Hello everyone, this is Rona from eMain Enterprises and thanks for joining us for this month's Best Practices webinar. And uh, as a software provider, you know, eMain does host quite a few different educational webinars including product demos and product training. So I always like to start to uh, clarify what the purpose of today's webinar series is. And our Best Practices webinars really focus on maintenance strategies. Uh, maintenance and reliability strategies that really help you improve your operations and your bottom line. And so rather than be focused on specific software features, we invite um, guest speakers from a variety of industries to kind of share their expertise and help you figure out how you can improve your maintenance program. So I'm always pleased to have with me uh, our guest speaker today, Terry Harris, who's the president of Reliable Process Solutions, and he's going to be pre presenting today's topic, Preventive Maintenance Techniques. And uh, hi, Terry, are you on the line with me? I'm on the line, Ron. Appreciate everybody getting on uh, on the call this morning. Yeah, and Terry, while um, while people are logging in, I mean, I know you've been in this industry, you know, both as a reliability engineer for decades and now running your own business and offering training going around the world so you do get to interact with a lot of people in our industry and you know maybe you can share a little bit about this particular presentation today and what sort of prompted you to put it together and why you feel it's important well it just just like you said as I travel around I do tr I do training and, and uh, audits and things like that around the world I've done these uh, reliability courses in 28 different countries and the, one of the key things that's, that, we, that we find out, and it's been really prevalent in the last couple of years, that people are really finding out that they want to know if the maintenance, uh, the PMs they're actually doing are actually adding value. So we do a lot of training around that, and that's part of developing this complete maintenance strategy we're talking about, and that's a key component is you know, making sure we do the correct PMs at the correct time. So it's a good, good uh, timing for this uh, webinar you're putting on. Perfect. And um, before I turn things over to Terry, for our listeners, I'd just like to go through a few housekeeping items. And um, we are recording today's session, and we're going to be sharing a link with all the uh, all of our attendees after the presentation so that you can share it with your team. But also, Terry has agreed to uh, share a copy of the PDF of his presentation. And uh, we'll have a survey that will... Uh, will display at the end of the webinar and if you can indicate there if you'd like to receive a copy Terry will share that with you and uh, we do have all the phone lines muted uh, so that we do get a nice clear recording but please uh, Terry has agreed to stay through the end of the hour to answer any questions you might have so go ahead and use the question feature and go to webinar and type your questions in at any time and then I'll read them to Terry at the end of the session and uh, so again, um, we have we do offer these best practices series on. We want to really be offering topics that you want to hear. So we'll also in this in the survey at the end ask you for suggestions for other type of topics that we can bring that help you improve your maintenance program. So with that, Terry, I'm going to turn things over to you. All right, thank you, Rona. And again, everyone, I appreciate you taking the time out today for the webinar. I think it's a very, very important topic because this is one of the things we have to do well before we move into other things we're going to do in our in our uh, maintenance programs. So today's topic, preventive maintenance techniques, we're going to look at the different things, the different ways to develop your preventive maintenance test. So again, a little bit, my company, Reliable Process Solutions, as Mona says, I, we, we started the company in, uh, in 2004. Uh, I, w I worked for Cargill for 25 years. Uh, you know, I'm a certified RCM facilitator in, in, in my use of my own RCM process now. But uh, you know, we do predictive training, teaching people what predictive technologies are out there to predict uh, failures. We're going to look at what proactive maintenance is. But we do some preventive maintenance training. We do a lot of lubrication audits and lubrication excellence training program because that's one of the key things in a proactive area is to make sure our lubes are perfectly clean, perfectly dry before we put them in the equipment. Uh, we do some equipment failure modes training. Uh, for a couple of my customers, we actually train maintenance people and operators on how every single component in their uh, operations and plants can fail, and then it, it helps them do better inspections and do better PMs. So some other things you can see down, we do some maintenance audits where we go and look at 22 different areas of maintenance. 
to determine how effectively you're uh, performing your maintenance process. And then, of course, down at the bottom, we built some plug and play loop storage rooms. We got into that business about four years ago, very, very popular uh, with both our facilities after the lubrication training. So, But again, if you look at this slide here, and I, always, I use this slide a lot in my training, and I always ask the question, looking at these two vehicles here, you know, for racing to the top of the hill in the background, who are you likely to put your money on to win that race? And most of us would say we'd put our money on the, on the vehicle on the right. If we're racing all the way across the U.S., you know, I always ask, does the one on the left have a chance? And there's some factors involved around that. You know, one of the key factors is, you know, what operator, or does the operator become a factor in how well those perform? And so if you have a facility and you don't have good operators, you don't have good operator training, you know, the operators can, can fail to win even with the vehicle on the right. Then I always ask about, you know, does it make any difference what kind of maintenance we do? And if we do the wrong kind of maintenance on the one on the right, that vehicle can, can fail. If we do the perfect maintenance on the one on the left, that vehicle can, can operate a long time. Then the cost of maintenance is another factor there. You know, what's the cost of maintenance of those two you're looking at? Well, the one on the right, it probably costs more to change the oil than it costs to change the whole engine and the one on the left. And then my last question pertaining to that picture is which one of those is your facility? How many of you on the call today have the Lamborghini type plant? all the new most modern equipment robots and all the new uh, modern electronic equipment to run the facility most of us don't the plants that call me for help or the plants I go into they are the one on the left they're 30 40 50 60 years old and we try to teach them and we try to look at their processes to make them competitive and because those plants are still there running today but if we can make them more competitive they can make more money and they can they can last a lot longer in the industry so what is preventive maintenance? You know, just a brief definition here. It's preventive maintenance is maintenance performed on a time-based or condition-based strategy. So which one, which task we, are we doing, and which one of those tasks fit that definition? So I always list the types of preventive maintenance I look at when I go into facilities. You know, how much time-based preventive maintenance do you have where you're doing something every week or every month? You have condition-based maintenance. And we'll talk about each one of these in the next few slides, but we have failure-finding tasks. I'm going to explain exactly what those are because those are tasks you should have in your PM process to find failures of specific equipment. We all have these OEM directives, so your manufacturer builds this equipment, he sends it just big long list of PMs you should do. How many of them are effective? Well, not very many. We have the hand-me-downs where people say, well, I've been doing that for 20 years. We have some regulatory PMs, EPA, OSHA, MSHA, all these different organizations that require us to do some specific PMs. Then sometimes we just do extra PMs because of risk. You know, it's a high dollar item. The equipment may cost $250,000, so we're going to throw in some extra PMs. But which ones are effective? So your time base, these are the ones that we perform on some time frequency. We do them every day, maybe sometimes every hour. We do them every week. We do them every month. Some PMs we have are quarterly and yearly. But how did you determine that frequency? You know, who told us in the beginning, or how have you developed that frequency? So this to look at and when we look at PM optimization we'll look at how often should we be doing these tests and then when we went up at the plant that I uh, managed for years we looked at all our PMs found out some of the things we did every week and every month could be moved to quarterlies and some of the things we were doing on quarterlies and yearly should be that, that frequency should be reduced but we used a method to determine that what about condition based you know task you do when you're doing your PM route there's some noise can we tighten something up is there some looseness is there a way to adjust something you know, do we take a measurement to find out that the PM needs to be uh, performed? You know, something is inside of a, of a, of a measurement, let's say a, a chain. You know, maybe there's PMs we, we have to do when the machine's not operating. You know, that's a condition base. The machine's not operating, that's the condition. Now we can perform PMs. Now this is one I go into a lot of facilities where all their PMs are when the equipment's down. Probably one of the worst times to do PMs because we're not actually getting good information. So some of these PMs, uh, we've been able to change at plants where we can do some inspections, do some checks while the equipment's are operating, buy them some specialty tools. And then maybe they're PMs we only want to do when the machine's at full load. You know, a lot of our machinery at plant, when it runs at 25 or 30 or 40 percent load, you know, we don't ever put the strain on the components where we can find out good, good, get good data as we're performing the PM. So here's some con condition-based things you need to look at. Failure finding. So people ask me all the time, well, what's a failure finding PM? Well, here's the definition. It's a task put in place 
to find a component that has failed, that maintenance or operation in their normal duties, normal operation, do not know or are not aware that it's failed. So some examples, a high level switch in a tank. So we have this tank, the liquid's supposed to come up and touch the high level switch, and when the liquid touches a high level switch, no matter what it is, maybe a dry product, but when it touches that switch, something's supposed to happen, it's supposed to close the valve. It's supposed to shut off the pump so we don't overflow the tank. How do we know that that switch will work when the liquid or product touches it? Well, a failure finding task is some task we have to do to test that switch. So the facility I came from, we had 60 or 70 liquid tanks. They all had high level probes. So monthly an operator would go around with a stick with a can of liquid on it. He would open the manhole cover and put it on the probe and somebody back in the control room would radio and say, yes, that, that probe actually worked. So that was a failure finding task for that, that particular part of the plant. What about high temperature switches and high pressure switches? Well, there's been a lot of failures. I mean, major failures. If you look at Chernobyl, you know, they weren't doing PM, so they had a nuclear meltdown in Chernobyl. If you look at Bhopal, India, three redundant uh, switches, a temperature switch, a pressure switch, and a safety relief uh, valve failed and it caused the deaths of around 20,000 people. So high temp switches, how do you know it's going to actually activate when it gets to that temperature? High pressure switches. How do we know the high pressure switch is going to work? If you take the example of a pressure relief valve on a boiler, that pressure relief valve maybe is supposed to relieve at 220 PSI. How do we know that's actually going to relieve when it gets to that pressure? Well, we have to develop some testing procedures to make sure these things are going to work. So those are called failure finding tasks. One of the key ones I find at many facilities, they have emergency stop switches. Well, they haven't tested. I was at a facility where they hadn't tested an emergency stop switch in 12 years. Well, when we finally tested it, we found out the switch was never wired correctly from day one, and they could have had a major incident. They didn't. You know, it's that law of averages, you know, but again, this, these are switches you have to check on some regular basis. So those are called failure finding tasks. Very important PMs to make sure you have. Now we have these OEM directed. So when the, when the original equipment manufacturer builds a piece of equipment, he sends you the manual and it's got all these PMs in there that you're supposed to do. Well, how many of those are actually effective? So from this long list of PMs, how do we know which ones we want to use? Well, sometimes to, to keep the warranty or to minimize warranty claims, you know, we have to do the PMs because that's the first thing they'll say when you try to collect a warranty board, did you do all the PMs? Did you do all the things we told you to do? Most of the times, we're going to, the answer is going to be no, and you don't collect the warranty anyway. But the majority of the time, unless you've went through these in some process to find out if the PMs actually find a failure, if they actually re reduce the uh, failure, we don't know if they work. Now, what I found out in the industry, 30 to 40 percent of all OEM PMs, they add no value. They really do nothing for the machine or nothing for the components. So again, we have to look at all those and make sure they're effective. And I'm, I know on the call here, and I'm, I'm sure we've got people from facilities that are, you know, 10 to 40 years old. But a lot of times our PMs were developed 30 or 40 years ago. They were developed because of a failure, a past failure, so we just keep doing them. And, uh, you know, when I go through PMs and I say, why are you doing this? And they go, well, we've been doing that for 20 years. We can't stop now. Well, we've always done these, so let's keep doing them. Well, those, those are not really good reasons to do PMs. We have to have a method to look at the PM and see if they actually add value. Are they finding a failure or are they adding life to some components? Now we all have these regulatory PMs, all these different organizations, you know, NFPA, MSHA, your fire, insurance, no matter what they are. Some of those we have to do, but many of those we can modify. There's different ways to do them. And I'll give you an example in the state of Ohio where I'm from. There was a state requirement that you had to trip your uh, pressure relief valves in your boilers every year. Well, I refused to do that because every time I tripped the safety relief valve in the boilers, they leaked. So I, I always told the inspector, no, I'm not going to do that task. And I asked one time, I said, what is my, what's the alternative? He said, well, then you have to change them every year or every two years. So that became my PM was to just change it, get it rebuilt, or put a new one on. Because if I tripped it, it leaked. And then I had energy losses. I had freezing issues outside from the drains. And so... That just became a way we changed the PM. And then we all have this risk thing, right? We have equipment in our plant that's high dollars, very expensive, high risk, potential for explosion, potential for release, potential for death. 
So the frequency may increase, but sometimes we do PMs based on risk. Well, let's make sure the PMs we're doing are actually mitigating that risk. So here's a poll question. You guys can answer this. I think rona has got some way you can answer this, but if you look back at the PMs that you have at your facilities now, what process did you use to develop your PM program? So just put A, B, C, or D. So here, A would be, did you use RCM to develop your PMs? We'll talk about that here in a minute. You know, did we use the OEM, the original equipment manufacturer's suggestions in its manual? You know, do we base a lot of our past failures on, or our PMs on past failures? So that failed one time, so let's start doing this PM to make sure it doesn't happen again. Or a lot of them, are they just best guess as we go around? Well, we better do this, we better do that. So just put A, B, C, or D in there in your poll question, and then we'll we'll just move on and we'll look at those at the end. I'll give you just Perfect. a Perfect, okay. Looks like we've got about 70% of the votes in, so we'll leave it open. A few seconds more. Okay. Some people are still voting. All right. Um, oh, still, still coming in. Um, okay. All right. Go ahead and uh, share the results with our audience. So, and again, this is in okay. aggregate, so uh, there's no wrong answers here. But it looks nope. like Terry, eight percent said RCM, forty-two okay. percent, or the largest number, OEM, the original equipment manufacturer. Twenty-nine percent said past failure. Twenty-one percent said best guess. So half okay. were based on best guess, past failure, balance largely. OEM. Right, okay. Back to you. Good. Good information. All right. Thanks, everybody, for participating. In that. So that's good information we can look at as we go through some of these methods that we're going to look at here in a few minutes. So I put a few slides in there. You can use these for training, but it's just some uh, different reasons. So these are called activities of preventive PM. So these are these routine functions performed at regular intervals of time or life cycles of use. So lubricating is a PM. Cleaning. Now, most people don't think cleaning is a PM, but sometimes we have to clean to find failures. So sometimes the operators we get to do that cleaning task and then the maintenance person can come in and do the next one, you know, a good inspection, visual by measurement. But a lot of times it has to be cleaned to inspect it. You know, adjusting things to some specification. You know, a lot of our OEMs say, well, when they, you know, every month or every two months you need to make this adjustment. Replacement of parts due to ordinary wear. Well, if we can see that or we can find that ordinary wear with some tool or some sense, we can replace the parts before they actually fail. You know, an activity is early identification of potential problems. I always used to tell my guys, we have to find things when we're doing PMs. And then, of course, a key one here, a key activity is documenting the PMs that were performed and what we found. This is one of the biggest shortfalls I find in the industry is the PM completion is a check mark or a set of initials and not really any documentation. John Mitchell wrote the book, Physical Asset Management Handbook. So he states in a book, a PM can be cost effective when the equipment operation is consistent, which means if it only runs two days a month, it's probably not very consistent. The average life is predictable within, within some reasonable spread. Failures of the equipment are well understood, so it's hard to develop a PM if you don't know how the component's going to fail. And then again, if you have useful failure statistics, so if we're actually tracking things in our CMMS system, you know, developing some mean time between failures or using some wide life analysis. You know, we have those statistics, so that can help us develop some good PM frequencies and some good PM inspections. Here's the goal of preventive maintenance. Reduce equipment failures. Reduce the magnitude of equipment failures or the repair cost. Reduce the product loss or the production downtime due to the equipment failure repair. And reduce the deterioration in the productive capacity of the equipment. Now, you wouldn't believe how many industries I go into, and they have machinery that was designed to do, let's throw a number out there, a 1,000 units per day or per hour. And they've accepted the fact that they're running 900 and they're, run, they're still running, so that's okay. But sometimes our PMs have to figure out what, are, what has made us reduce our capacity of our equipment. Then here's the functions of preventive maintenance. And these are good ones to go over with your maintenance people but permit the asset to perform the function for which it was designed, purchased, and installed. That example I just gave you, so many companies have equipment that's not doing what it was designed, purchased, or installed to do. Again, we have to ensure the safety of the personnel using the asset and the safety of the assets itself. 
So when you're looking at guarding and things like that, those are what we're doing there. We're inspecting that so our employees can't get hurt. Ensure the asset continues to operate at, to its specification of tolerance of design. Ensure the upper asset operates without failure or disruption. And then we're trying to maximize or extend the asset's useful life. Now one of the things I do, I train reliability engineers. And one of the key things that I talk to reliability engineers about is your job is to extend the life of the equipment. So if you have equipment that you have mean time between failure data on, and once you say, well, this equipment fails every year, as a reliability engineer, you have to say, well, why does it fail in a year? And what do I have to do to make it last two years or five years? So let's take a subjective PM here. And here's one that says, on our plant rounds, make sure to inspect the block valve in the east pipe rack for any issues. So you know, what were your comments? Is that a good PM? It says inspect the block valve. Well, look at this. Is this not a block valve? So what is the inspection technique? You know, the valve at this location has been taken out and they have a block there, but you know, I consider that to be a block valve. So again, how do we develop these tasks and make sure they're not subjective? So if we look at the RCM process, and I'll briefly describe what RCM is. So the RCM process actually looks at equipment and determines how these components can fail. These failures in RCM are called failure modes. So every failure has the potential for a PM task. So every time I do an RCM analysis, I always ask three questions. When you develop the failure mode or determine the failure mode, I always ask three questions. Can you predict the failure with a predictive technology? Can you prevent the failure with a preventive maintenance task? Or can you eliminate the failure by redesign? Now, if you can't do any of those three things, you may want to say, well, let's let the component run the failure. And we'll just change it when it fails. So there's a few things, a very small percentage of things you'll do when you do an RCM task that you run the failure. But most of the time, we can develop a predictive or a preventive task to mitigate the failure. So how do you perform an RCM analysis? Well, you would pick a process or a piece of equipment we want to evaluate. And what I do, I take easel pads and I list every single component in that process and I put them on easel papers around the room. And then for each of those components, I ask the question, how can the component fail or how has it failed? And I call those failure modes. And then again, I, like I said before, I ask these three questions. Is there a way to predict it with a predictive technology? Is there a way to prevent it with a preventive maintenance task? Or can I completely eliminate the failure by putting something in more robust or a better component? Or again, you can go down the bottom here. Do I just want to let it run to failure because it doesn't cause any safety, environmental, or downtime issues? So again, that's a whole other training program. Now here's an example of my RCM database. This is a cheap, nice cheap database. Most of the ones on the market are $18,000, $20,000. This is a nice cheap RCM database. You can see up at the top here we have this pump that's supposed to pump 100 gallons a minute at 50 PSI. We determine it's unable to operate at all because this bearing fails due to contaminated loops. So we have this big box here. We can put a failure effect statement in. We can put evidence. What does the operator see when this pump fails? Well, he sees a pressure alarm, 659. The operator's going to try to restart the pump. So here we can give the operator some things he's supposed to inspect or do, which makes a troubleshooting guide. But we go through this whole process. We develop a ta uh, some tasks down here, any number of tasks you want down below here. But it says develop a procedure to filter the lubricant and verify correct lube for the application. What kind of failures does it cause? Well, it's evident to the operator. It may cause a quality issue. may cause a downtime issue. We need to develop a new PM. So again, we can check these boxes. So what does checking the boxes here actually do for us? Well, in this database, every time you put data in the database, it automatically goes to the report area. So look at all the reports you can develop just with a click of a button or the click of, a, of here. So if I say I want to see every failure that has to do with quality in my RCM, I would click RCM, I would click Create Failure Modes, and then my next slide, whoops, I don't have an enter. Next slide, you just get a report on every failure of that piece of equipment that affects quality. Or let's say I wanted to see what every PM I've developed. So it's a nice, easy database to use, and it's actually very effective at developing that a complete maintenance strategy. So this database here, is going to tell you if you want to develop a predictive technology to detect the failure, a PM will detect it, we want to redesign. So there's all kinds of things you can use the database for. It covers energy losses, environmental health and safety, it covers rate, downtime. So again, one of the most effective databases on the market to not only do the RCM, but automatically do all your reports. So again, that's another training program for the future, but a very effective way of developing those PMs.
So the process using in my software, you're going to develop the correct PMs, and this will be the beginning. I always tell people you have to get this PM thing done. This is the start of your complete maintenance strategy. What are your PMs going to be? What are the predictive technologies going to be that you're going to use? Now, the reverse of RCM is called PM optimization. So in reliability centered maintenance, we look at failures of components and what preventive maintenance strategy to be effective. In PM optimization, we already have the preventive maintenance steps. And now what we're going to do is say, which of these preventive maintenance tasks do I have is actually adds value and, and, and reduces or increases my component life cycle. So here's how this process works. And I put this slide up here. It says here that your company may be no different than many, most companies. You hope your PMs are effective. You hope you get enough time to do them this month. And you can count on the fact that people know what check the pump means. So how many PMs do you have in your facilities that say check the pump, check the fan, you know, check the conveyor? What do those mean? Now to a maintenance person who has 20 or 30 years in, he'll know what that means and he'll go out and do some tasks. But to a maintenance person who has six months or a year in, what does he actually do? Does he actually go out there and say, yes, the pump is still there, it's not making any noise? So how many of your PMs are act actually subjective? Preventive maintenance is effective at reducing there's only a few manufacturing equipment component failures. So in order for a PM to be effective, it must be applied to the correct component at the correct interval, and the inspection must not be subjective. So look at your PMs and make sure they're not subjective. Here, these are two examples. I was at a facility in Canada, and these are two components that came in that where the maintenance person and the operator said they did their PMs. So when I took them back out there on the example on the left, here's a motor completely they cover. I took both of them out there, the maintenance man and the operator, and I put a temperature gun on the front bearing. And it was, uh, I forget what the temperature was, but it was like 165 degrees. So I had the maintenance person and the operator clean the fan guard off, clean all the dirt and, and build up off this motor. Well, the temperature of the front bearing reduced by 35 degrees. Now, if anybody knows what the failure rate is on motor insulation, motor insulation for every 18 degree rise in the temperature of the, of the insulation on the windings, it cuts the life of that insulation in half. So here we reduce this 35 degrees, almost getting four times the life out of our insulation. So again, once they understand those things, and now this took two months to get this way, we clean this every week. Here's another bearing up here, completely covered with dust, and there's dust not only getting in the lubricant, but that you can't get to the greaser. Or if they do get to it, it's covered with dirt and dust. So our PMs have to be non-subjective. We just don't want to look at it and say it's still there. Another one, you know, if, we, if I ask you to all to take a piece of paper, what are the failure modes you see here? And again, this was one where the PM was just completed on this a day or two before this. You can see that the maintenance person probably wiped this off to make sure the coupling was still turning in there. But again, lots of failure modes motor insulation, there's dirt and dust around the bearings, there's dirt and dust around the fill port uh, on the gearbox. And here's an extra pipe wrench down here that somebody's probably missing out of their tools. But again, the PM should say, clean this and do these inspections, instead of just saying it's still there and I can still see the coupling turning inside. Well, here's PM optimization. You'll have this form on your uh, slide presentation. If, if we may do a, a separate training program, but these are the questions you ask. So you select a piece of equipment in your plant for a PM, and we start asking these questions. You know, make a list of the current PM task and frequency of the task. Then I ask these four questions, and, and this comes from a presentation that, that Ron Moore, who wrote Making Common Sense, Common Practice. Ron Moore, this is a lot of his information. I just add a little bit to it, but very, very good presentation, very good speaker. But it says, does the task help identify onset to failure? You know, is it an inspection or a, adjustment or calibration? Does the task help me avoid failure or extend life? Is it a lubrication task, some kind of measurement, some kind of filter change out? Is it related to a known consistent failure mode that we already know about? Belt life, grinder hammers, flexible couplings have known lives, depending on temperature. DC motor brushes. It says, does the PM task help me to find or avoid a significant failure? You know, if your answer is no to any of these questions above, can the PM task be eliminated? Here's one, does the task have adequate specification? So if you have a failure, we can take corrective action. You know, does your, does your PM say check the belts? Or does it say check the belts to assure good condition? No slipping or flipping. If it can be isolated, check for proper tension of more than, more than one inch deflection with a five pound load. 
Or my guys wanted, we, I bought them battery strobe lights, the little handheld ones you carry around, they're like $300. Well, now I can take the strobe light, I can look inside the guard, I can see the belt, I can stop the belt, I can look into the shiv to see if the shiv's warm. You know, I can check the speed of the fan to make sure it's running what speed it's supposed to run. So again, one little $300 tool, I'm able to do non-subjective belt inspections. Now it says here, what's the process for your test frequency? Is it based on a known failure rate? Do you have some equipment history data in your files? You know, do you have some main time between failures? Are you doing Weibull analysis? Is it just best judgment or what I call tribal knowledge? You know, well, I think we should do this, and I think we should do it this often. Is there some regulatory requirement? When we're doing it? So what's that frequency? Now it says here, for each PM task, high consequence of failure may increase the frequency of the PM or the PDM task. 6B, based on the above information, should the frequency be increased or decreased for that current task? Many times we can decrease the frequency or increase or, you know, make it, make it longer, decrease the frequency so you can do it monthly instead of weekly. Here's one I used to get on my guys about. They would bring their PMs in. I would ask them, I said, what'd you find? They say, oh, nothing, everything's okay. I would say, no, everything's not okay because we're still having failures. I want you to have fines. I used to use the word fines all the time. If you do a PM or you do a PDM, with your tools, I want fines. I was always hollering about the word fines. You have to find something. You can't tell me everything's good. It says, what is the failure found or eliminated by using the task? Is the PM intrusive? Can doing the PM cause infant mortality issues? You know, a lubrication task, if you dump a dirty lube in or a lube with moisture in it, it can cause a component to fail. So make sure the PM task is not causing the component to fail earlier. Is this good to get into the schedule, rebuild tasks, be deferred or eliminated by using a PDM method? So a lot of times as you start using predictive technology tools, such as the little handheld vibration tools or a, a thermographic tool or just a handheld temperature gun or a mechanical ultrasound tool, if you use those, use those tools, maybe you don't need the PM anymore. Here's an interesting one I ask the question all the time. Could any of the items such as tightening, adjusting, lubricating, cleaning, inspecting be done by an operator? It says operators can in many cases perform these tasks on higher frequencies and reduce failures. Now I've got one of my customers, I can't mention their name, but we now train operators on all the failure modes of their equipment so they can do inspections. Now we don't consider, that since they're a union plant, we don't consider these inspections maintenance. We can call them operator care. But again, it depends what's your plant culture, what's your training program, what's your safety issues, what's the plant culture, is it a union environment? All these things are going to affect what operators can do, but like I said, this, this company, they're a strong union, but we do operator care tasks, which we pass more information on the maintenance. Can the PMs be consolidated by covering them all in one downtime or service visit? Are there any failures or known failure modes that are not being covered? You'll find these out doing this task. Are there any hidden failures that need to be added? These are your failure finding tasks. These are these things can fail. We don't even know that they failed. It says here the optimization program, you can review it every three to five years for continuous improvement. But again, the last statement here, which Ron Moore covers in detail, don't assume OEM vendor PMs are correct and don't assume everything you're doing now is correct. Here's a work distribution model. I wanted to throw this into the training day because it, it sometimes uh, we need to go back and look at where we're spending our labor hours. It says here 15% of your labor hours dedicated to doing PMs. 15% of your labor hours dedicated to fixing items found during PM inspections, which means your maintenance people should be finding things. PDM, 15% of your labor hours performing PDM inspections. Buy them the tools, the mechanical ultrasound tools, the small handheld vibration tools, the thermographic cameras, strobe lights. So use these PDM tools. Now it says here 25% of your labor hours are correcting issues found from PDM inspections, which means we should find more failures with PDMs than we do PMs. And here, 30% of your labor hours doing proactive tasks. Now, we haven't trained on that yet. That's another training session, but I'll show you a little bit of that in the last slide. But again, one thing that's missing on this slide is reactive maintenance or the corrective maintenance. Well, what it's trying to tell you here is if we do good PMs, we correct those issues, we correct PM or issues from PDMs, we should have very little reactive maintenance. Well, here's a perceived world class slide here. 18% reactive. So how, how much reactive maintenance do you do? How many of those things do you just go fix as operators and maintenance people find it? It should be less than 
40% of 7% is preventive, 35% predictive. This is one company or one person's view on this. Asset criticality, another important task. You know, when, when I worked for Cargill, we decided that we started doing all these things, but we didn't have a good way to determine what assets we really worked on first. So we use asset criticality. And we ask a bunch of questions. Can the component fail and cause a safety issue? Can the component fail and cause an environmental issue? Can it cause a food safety issue? Can the component fail or cause a quality issue? So you rate all these things as you go through. You know, can operations, what, what effect does the failure have on operations? What effect does it have on maintenance? And we develop a score from all these questions we ask. And here's my little simple asset criticality database. So you click the, the safety tab and you ask questions about it. Does the component have a safety, a critical safety device or is it a critical safety? Can it cause potential injury? This one here has potential for serious injury or death. Is there a loss potential? And this one here, does there a fire explosion potential? So as you select these drop downs, you can change these ratings to whatever you want. It gives you a score in safety, but it also keeps changing the overall score on the left side of the box. So we, we do the environmental impact. We do the food safety impact. If you're not a food safety plant, you just don't use that tab. We do the quality tab. We do an operations tab, which asks questions about operations and maintenance. But here you can see this component here gets an overall rating of 450. So the plan I came from, we, we, we just said after we did the whole analysis, we looked to report everything of, of a score above a 750 was A-critical. Everything below 300 was C-critical. <clears throat> everything between 300 and 750 was B-critical. So now this went into our CMMS system on every PM and really every task we did. So now the PMs came out as A, B, and C. So when I go into plants that have high reactive maintenance, one of the things they miss is their PMs because they're out there fixing stuff all the time. So what I say is, here guys, what we have to do is, if it says A critical, we have to do it. It can never be missed. That's our most critical equipment. If the PMs B critical, I always say we can miss that one cycle, but we have to go back and do it which means we may have to work overtime, we may have to bring outside contractors in, but you can't miss APMs ever. Bs, you can miss some, but now our C-critical PMs, those low ones, they could be missed four or five cycles, or you know what, I always tell them, we, we never have to do them, because they're not gonna cause a big failure, they're not gonna cause an environmental issue, and maybe some of these C-criticals can be done by an operator. But you, I find out everywhere I go, once you start doing the A-critical PMs, most of your major failures go away. Now here I'm going to I'm going to ask you a question. This is one of the poll questions. Are you currently using some kind of PM ranking or have you used asset criticality? So just answer yes or no to that question. We'll give you a couple minutes to do that. And then we'll move on to finish up. Perfect. So again, I've just launched the poll, so if you don't mind going ahead and just saying are you currently using a PM ranking or asset criticality in prioritizing your PMs? All right, looks like we've got this most of the votes in. Just leave it a few more seconds here. So people weigh in. Okay, let's see. Here. So nice round numbers here, Terry. So it looks like 25% say yes, they are using some form of criticality or ranking. And 75% say no, they're not currently using a ranking method. Okay. All right, good information right. to have as we move through. So, excellent, thank you. All right, now we're going to talk about my PF curve a little bit here. So it says here, when I go into plants, there's only four different kind of maintenance I look for. And the first one is how much reactive maintenance are you doing? And defining reactive maintenance as not as unplanned work or those things that just happen. So we always try to get that percent. What percentage of your work is predictive? What percent is proactive and what percent is preventive? So here's the slide I use in all my training processes. So if you look at the left side of this curve, what it says here is if you're finding failures over here on the left side in this reactive area, which means we're using human senses. Uh, so somebody comes in and tells us the bearing's hot or we feel something or we have noise. Well, that's re we have to react to those things if we're finding them in human senses. So you're only going to be 10 or 15% effective or efficient maintenance. Now again, this curve, this, this PF curve training is another training program that we can offer. It takes about 45 or 50 minutes to go through this whole thing and understand it completely. But again, reactive, you're only 10 or 15% effective or efficient maintenance. As we start using up, going up the curve here, 
And what this curve shows you is over here on this, the left side is equipment performance, across the bottom is time. So if we have equipment over here on the left side that's brand new or it's rebuilt, it's in its peak performance, but over time it follows the curve down where it wears out. And most of you in maintenance and reliability have seen this curve in different forms. But what it says up here, up here where we don't detect failures with human senses, where we have to use these predictive technologies like mechanical ultrasound, vibration analysis, if we use these technologies effectively and they tell us early on that something's going wrong and we correct it, and I'll give you just a quick example. Let's say vibration analysis tells you, <clears throat> excuse me, that a coupling's misaligned. Well, if we go align that coupling right away, the two bearings around that coupling won't fail for a long, long life cycles. So that's just one example. But again, it says if we use predictive technologies, we react to the data, we could be 30 to 50% effective in maintenance. Now we go over here to the proactive part of the curve. This is the part of the curve where the equipment's brand new or in peak condition. How do we keep it that way? Well, perfectly clean loops, perfect, perfect alignment, perfect balance. Who do we buy our components for for our critical equipment? You know, who makes the best motor? Who makes the best bearing? What do we tell our suppliers? Like, and I'll give you an example motor rebuild shop. How many of you, when you rebuild a motor, tell the motor rebuild shop to balance the rotor and the electric motor to 0 0.05 inches per second or less? If you do that task, the motor will last longer. We have all these metrics. Are you, how are you measured to know how effective you are? How are you doing asset criticality, equipment ranking? You know, are you using RCM, TPM, total productive maintenance? You know, how are you using root cause analysis? Are you using over here at the bottom of the curve after the failure? Or can you be proactive with the failure mode effect analysis? You know, reliability center design teams, training programs, written procedures, planning, scheduling, your CMMS program, all things that are in the proactive area. And if we do parts and pieces of these, we can become 70 to 100% effective in maintenance. So the more things we do on the left side, the, the, the less things you do on the right side of this curve. So here's what happens. We, if we're over here and we're in 80% of our work's reactive, we have to now get our maintenance people trained to start doing some predictive things. We have to get our maintenance people trained to do lubrication excellence, precision alignment, do all these things over here. Because like I said, the more things we do toward the left side, the less things you do on the right side, on your reactive area, the less downtime you'll have. Now, I put PM task across here because I don't know where all of you are in your reliability program, but as you become more reliable, your PM tasks change. I'll give you one quick example here. Let's say our PM task is to change the oil in a piece of equipment every month. Well, if we start doing oil analysis, we'll change the oil in the equipment when it needs it, when the additives are gone or when the oil's oxidized. You know, so it, your PM tasks change as you get more reliable. And again, that's a whole other training program we can talk about. But here, we talk about precision work. And here's a big slide I use when I'm training maintenance guys on precision work. And I ask the question, is that precision work? And the, and the answer to that question, it is precision work. And it's precision work because he went precisely around the stick in the road when he was painting the stripe. And the reason he did that is probably because he didn't have a procedure that said he should get out of the truck, move the stick, and then paint a perfectly straight line. But you'll find out as you look at some of your maintenance practices with your maintenance technicians that even though they've been there 20 or 30 years, are they doing these kind of things on precision work? You know, I, show, I always show a slide of a motor that was being... And re, well, here it is. Here's a motor that was being aligned at a power plant in Cincinnati. So the maintenance guy spent seven hours aligning this motor. And then when they were done, I took this picture. But look at some of the bad techniques. The bolt doesn't come through the nut. There's marks on the side of the motor that were beating the motor around. It's a 150-horse motor. The base is too thin. They reused the shims. They didn't use a torque wrench. So here they thought by having the $16,000 laser alignment tool that they were doing precision work. And and I could, I could write down 10 different things here I see wrong that make it non-precision work. So again, look at your processes. What are you actually doing and is it precision work? Here's one that most maintenance people don't know. I've been with maintenance guys that have been in business for 30, 40 years. I came from a farm, and but when you're cutting the keyway in a shaft, the keyway, this is how long the keyway should be. A plus B, the length of the keyway plus the length of the cupping divided by two. And then they should be 180 degrees from each other. If we cut these keyways full length and we put both keyways on top, you're going to have an imbalance situation, which is going to cause the bearings and the pump of the motor to fail earlier. Most maintenance guys say, oh, that doesn't make that much difference. One ounce of imbalance on a 12-inch on a diameter pump impeller reduces bearing life by 58 or 48% is the actual number. Again, 
We had developed an effective PMs. Use RCM. Failure mode effective mouse, PM motivation to develop the most effective PMs. Use asset criticality to determine which equipment is critical and never miss those PMs on high critical equipment. You know, develop effective PMs. If you've got non-subjective PMs like check this or check that, you got to make put them in more detail. And then start measuring the percent of PMs completed. Now, the reason I say this is because sometimes we assume that your PMs are getting done. But if you guys are doing a lot of reactive maintenance, their PMs probably are not getting done. I was at a pharmaceutical plant one time. They showed in their CMS system that 99% of the PMs were being completed. Well, I spent two weeks there doing various things like maintenance audits, turned in the number that 50% of the PMs were being completed. The rest of them were being pencil whipped because that's what they were told to do to pass the audit. So measure the percent PMs completed. Here's a slide. This is a customer of mine. You can see here when we went there and measured the PMs that they were doing, 29.7% or 29% PMs completed. Reactive maintenance, 56%. We did acid criticality. We started doing PMs. Here we did 33% of the, oh, excuse me, we did 53% of the PMs. Now only 33% reactive. So we were able to reduce reactive maintenance and, and breaks, break, failures because we started doing effective PMs. That's actual statistics. So again, can you compete? Where do you want to be? You know, which one of those is your plant and where do you want to take it? So the last question on the pool questions, and I think this wraps it up, but do you think your PMs need some evaluation? So answer yes or no to that poll question. Great. So hopefully Terry's given you lots of food for thought here. And uh, so please be honest and just say, as a result of this, do you think you would like to go back and optimize or reevaluate some of your PMs based on what you learned today? And See, it looks like we've got about 80% in. Leave it open a few more seconds, just so you can see how you fare relative to everyone else. All right, let's go through and share it. So, well, Terry, it's a. <laughs> it looks like uh, I guess some people picked up a few things here because 96% said their PMs do need some evaluation, where 4% are feeling that nope, they're you know pretty well optimized. All right. Any? Uh, I'll turn that back to you, Terry. Okay. Oh, are you ready? Well, again, for that's, that's the end of the. That's if there's any questions out there, we can. Uh, we'll I'll, I'll, uh, answer some questions. Otherwise, you can email me, and and I'll answer them there. Perfect. Well, we've had so many people requesting um, a PDF of the presentation and how you do that. So when I end the webinar, there'll be a brief survey, and there's a couple things we ask. Tell us how we did today. Um, there's a little place you can indicate if you'd like a copy of the presentation. And then also, we always like to hear what other topics would you like us to bring to you. You know, people like Terry have such a wealth of knowledge. And maybe, Terry, you can share a few of the other topics that you've done training on that you've seen are very popular that can help inspire our listeners for future topics they'd like to vote on. Okay, well, I, I'll say in the early years, you know, Pete, there was a big uh, interest in RCM, but RCM is very labor intensive and, and people are cost intensive. Uh, my database is cheap. I can show you how to use it online. That's another one. But I mean, that was popular. Uh, uh, the lubrication training, the lubrication audits are very popular. Uh, the PM training is very popular over the last two years. There are more and more companies realizing that if they don't do effective PMs, but we do we do some three day reliability courses. We do some three day courses for maintenance level people, to, so they understand how components fail. And then once we understand how the component can fail, we can develop good good maintenance strategies and good PMs around that. Great. Um, can you tell us too that you know you mentioned about optimizing PMs and it. Um, you know, it certainly resonated with our listeners who said they felt that their PMs need to be reevaluated. But how did you go about performing that type of audit, Terry? A maintenance audit, to a maintenance excellence audit. Yeah, a maintenance excellence audit is a 22-step audit we do. We go in and look at everything you're doing, all the way from PMs to PDMs to oil analysis, how you're tracking the data, what kind of maintenance procedures you have in place, written procedures. So it's a 22-step audit where we look at all the different levels and all the different ways of maintenance. I actually look, we actually try to figure out how much reactive maintenance you're doing, developing a definition of what reactive maintenance is. But it's an audit that gives you a full 
picture of where you're at and then we always try to give you two or three things that you should probably work on this year and then a couple things for the next two years because these reliability programs are not something that happens overnight. They're a lot of times they're not things that you can change in a year, but as you improve your reliability process over two or three years, you know, huge effects uh, in, in your plan uptime and your, and your profits. Okay, great. And uh, we had a couple of listeners asking who are just getting started, where do you go about getting a good list of PM tasks and descriptions? You were saying you don't want to keep them general, they need to be very specific. So if you're just getting started, where are some good places to, to go for that information? Well, and, there, and there really there's not a lot of that information out in the industry. I usually send people a little uh, uh, three or four page document I have that lists all your different equipment like motors, bearings, and pumps and all those things, and I list how those components can fail. And then you look through that and determine which, which of those failures are prevalent in your industry or at your facility, and then you write PMs around how those components are actually failing at your facility. So it's a long process. You have to look at what you're doing now and then what you should be doing. So, and it's a different answer for each. That's why it's hard to answer that question. Sure. And someone was just also wrote in who's in uh, responsible for maintenance at a commercial office building. And are maintenance okay. audits a little different or, you know, any places to go for templates for those or a good starting point? No, they're, they're going to be the same, maybe not as much different equipment types there, but the audit's going to cover the same kind of areas uh, that you would at a, at a major manufacturing facility. It's just, just different, uh, you know, facilities have uh, equipment that's handling air and, and cooling and things like that, but some of the same kind, of, we just look at the failure modes of, the, of some of that equipment and, and do some of the same things. Okay. Terry, you also referenced, you know, obviously many of our listeners today either have a CMMS, uh, email to others, or, you know, at least considering one. So you referenced a lot of different information that needs to go into your CMMS. So can you maybe kind of summarize what are the key pieces of information that's really going to allow our listeners to use their CMMS as a good tool to start to optimize? Yeah, that's a great question, Mona. You saw that in my uh, in my proactive curve. You have to have good, effective CMMS systems. So, you know, I think most of the customers I go into, they're printing PMs out of their CMMS, whether they're subjective or non-subjective. A lot of times, the actual maintenance person is not closing out the PMs. So you're not collecting a lot of good data because, you know, one of the things that eMate teaches and I teach when I talk about CMMS systems, if you put good data in, you get good data out. So just checking a box that the PM was done is, to me is not good data. So we have to put in there what the person actually did, what he actually found, you know, maybe some keeping some history data like that. So one of the most effective tools in any uh, PM program or PDM program is that CMS system. Absolutely. And one of the things you alluded to early on in the presentation was doing um, time-based preventive maintenance uh, versus condition-based. But we also offer an option in our uh, software, Terry, that allows you to do it based on usage of the equipment. And yep. do you have any good rules of thumb for when to apply that, you know, usage base versus purely a calendar? Well, and again, it's going to be different in every industry, but you have to collect some data. So a lot of people do it on time, and then they find out if we can actually track how many hours it runs, that's actually more effective. Some, that's actually more effective than just saying I'm going to do it every week, because you have some equipment that may run different, more uh, hours one week or more hours one month. So actually the time based or there the, the condition based where you're actually looking at how many hours is ran is actually more effective than just saying I'm going to do this task every week or every month. Great. So by condition based you're also really meaning um, usage. How much usage yep, you yeah, Usage has. should be a condition based ship. Okay. And uh, Terry, we've also had people asking, you mentioned that three to four page document that you have, so is the best way, perhaps I'll just ask listeners if uh, when you send a copy of the presentation, if anyone has an interest in that, can they reach out to you to get a little more information? Sure, sure. Or we can, we can, okay. we can also, also send that to you where you can post it on your website somewhere in your, in your system, so very valuable tool. Okay, great. And maybe we can include that along with the recording for today's session. Sure. All right, well, Terry, well, thank you so much for putting this together. Um, you know, it's a wealth of information and great reference material, great insights, and thank you for sharing your experience with our listeners. And uh, 
thank you to our listeners for spending the hour with us and uh, hope you found this valuable and I really do hope you just take a moment when I conclude the webinar um, let us know how we did make some suggestions for other topics you know uh, speakers like Terry can really speak to a variety of different topics and we want to make sure we're providing you with the tools to be successful so Thank you, Terry, and thanks to our listeners. And uh, also, we hope to see you uh, at, for the email customers out there. Uh, we do have an Accelerate Local coming up. I think we're going to be in uh, Los Angeles next week. And uh, we have some other events lined up. And for those of you not let, yet customers, email sit in the road and just shoot us an email at marketing at email. We're happy to send you more information. So, And please reach out to Terry as well. Thank you, Terry. Good luck in your travels. <laughs> All right. Thank you. And thanks to all our listeners. We'll see you all the next time.